Okay, I blame Dean, KK4DAS, uh, president of the Vienna Wireless Society, for this project. It, it's one of those things that just sort of came up by, uh, I guess, what we could call spontaneous construction. But I also blame Farhan. Farhan is responsible for much of this. Uh, and also Wes. Wes started all this back in November 1968 with his, his article in QST about uh, direct conversion receivers. Let me explain some of the background. So um, I, guess, I guess it started really for me when, when Farhan put out his article uh, on the Daylight Again analog transceiver. So in that receiver, he uses a really interesting... VFO circuit built around what's frequently referred to as a permeability tuned oscillator. This is one of those uh, VFOs that doesn't have a variable cap in it, but it has an inductor in which a screw goes into the center of the inductor and changes the capacitance. Farhan built his around a little 3D printed coil form, and I saw it and I said, man, I got to make one of those. So Farhan sent the file for the 3D coil form to Dean, who printed one out for himself and printed one for me. And here it is. Look at that. It's a thing of beauty. It's a Hartley coil, and it goes to a very simple Hartley-based uh, VFO circuit made out of two J310s. And I found it to be remarkably stable. And we also kind of built, um, uh, well, it, it really remarkably stable and we tested it and, uh, it's, it's, it's really nice. And so got it, got it stable and everything else like that. But this started us on the path of building other VFOs, some of them, which had the PTO circuit in it. So one of the, one of the other VFOs that, that Farhan was talking about is, a really, really simple Colpitz design that has an unusual feature in that the feedback capacitors are also the frequency determining capacitors. So very frequently in a, in a very often in a Colpitz, you'll see two capacitors that form the feedback network. Then there's a coupling cap. And on the other side of the coupling cap, you have another capacitor a variable capacitor and a coil, and that forms the frequency determining element. But Farhan was trying to, to simplify this thing, and, and he used a, a, a technique that you don't see all that often, that basically has the coupling capacitors as the frequency determining element. Guapo is barking. Anyway, there's the, uh, there's the circuit. And you can see how he has these coupling capacitors over here, when normally they would be on this side. Let me close the door so Guapo doesn't bother us. Guapo. So Dean built this thing and he had a tough time getting it stable and I built it and I had a tough time getting it stable. And then just consulting uh, EMRFD and, and other sources, I decided to try to increase the value of the emitter emitter resistor from 470 to 3.3K. And also, um, I think Farhan originally had a 0.1 microfarad, essentially a coupling ca cap, taking the frequency determining and feedback elements into the, into the resistor. I didn't have a polystyrene 0.1 microfarad cap. So I just substituted it with a 151 picofarad NP0 cap. Also, I didn't have polystyrene caps at these values, so I used two 680 picofarad silver micas. And for the coil, uh, I didn't use uh, a fancy um, PTO coil form because I only had one. So I built a coil. You can see it here. It's ugly, ugly, ugly. It's built on one of my traditional cardboard uh, coat hanger tubes, and it's covered with uh, pink nail polish varnish that I got from the local drugstore amidst a much suspicion. But anyway, I built this thing, and this was before I added 
the variable capacitor. All I wanted to do was build this circuit and see if I could get it stable. And man, it became really stable. Once I changed that resistor, mostly I think that was the, the big change. I don't, I don't think that the, uh, the change to the 151 picofarad uh, NP0 made much difference, but changing that resistor down there in the emitter from 470 to 3.3K seemed to make a big difference. I think at the lower resistor value, the transistor might have been moving in, in and out of, out of saturation, which may have been adding an instability. So anyway, I got this VFO working. I even built a little, very the very simple little buffer circuit that Farhan had in there, and that seemed to seemed to work okay. I mean, it didn't not not great buffering, but but it was okay. So then I had this uh, this VFO, and I and I was I was thinking, okay, maybe now I'll add or change out my old ugly coil and change it for a really nice, you know, PTO coil. But I didn't want to mess this one up. I might use this for something else. Whoa. Knock the camera over. Ooh, that's not good. Anyway, very poor YouTube production values here. I'm sorry. But anyway, <laughs> um, I, I decided, look, I have a bunch of old variable cap, caps around, and I have this one. And it measured about, oh, about 20, 25 picofarads from minimum to maximum. So I put that in there, and I just put it across the coil, all right? And I noticed that I could shift the frequency by about 171 uh, kilohertz, which is fine, gets me across most of the 40 meter phone band. I adjusted the coil by pulling off turns until I got the VFO running on the phone in the phone band on 40 meters with this thing. I had to add this, um, kind of ceramic insulator because I was getting a lot of hand effect. Every time I grabbed the, uh, the control, frequency would change a lot. So I put that ceramic thing in there. I have a uh, reduction drive ready to go. Look at that. That's a beautiful reduction drive that I may put in here sometime in the future. But for now, it, it, it's okay. Anyway, that's the VFO in the buffer circuit. Then the next thing I built was the um, the mixer circuit. And here's the mixer. Now, this is a simple two-diode mixer. It's singly balanced. And I have the VFO signal, or the local oscillator signal, coming across what's usually referred in these diagrams as L1. Here's the two diodes, and here's the output. I mean, here's the, the signal input coming into the two diodes. The output comes across the, um, the junction of L2 and L3. The coil, by the way, was one that Farhan left me when he visited, and it's uh, just 10 turns tri-filler wound on an FT43 material core, about 33 microhenries uh, per coil. And this circuit provoked quite a bit of discussion among the makers at, at Vienna Wireless. We were talking about it last night, and there are several different configurations seen. Um, one configuration of this circuit appears in Solid State Design for the Radio Amateur on pages 74 and 75, but it's a bit different from this one. This one is very similar to the one that Doug Dumas had in the balanced modulator of his uh, DSB article in CQ Magazine. This, this circuit is also identical, pretty much identical, to the one used by Farhan in his BIDX 20 and the BIDX module circuitry. He, there he uses the same circuit for the balance modulator and the product detector. And in this case, it's the, the product detector circuit that we have. But the, the, but the really important point is that in Farhan's circuit and in DeMauw's, and in most of the circuits that appear later in EMRFD, the, uh, the VFO signal comes in across L1, and it is the VFO signal that is balanced out. The RF signal coming in from, from the antenna is, um, is not, not balanced out. It's very weak. 
And the audio here is taken from, from this port, from the junction of L2 and L3. Um, for the audio, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me talk about the audio now since we're there. I have one little FET audio kind of a preamplifier here that I built on the same board. So the audio comes out here and it goes into this little FET uh, preamp. From there, it goes down through this pot that I've kind of just temporarily jury-rigged here into a two-stage audio amplifier that I built a while back that has a little AF transformer and goes to this speaker. This is just a speaker. It's not amplified or anything. So when I demonstrate, you guys will be hearing the real deal. Not, I'm not cheating by using an amplified computer speaker. All right, so the, other, the only circuit left to describe is the input. Here's the antenna input coming here. And I have a little capacitive uh, divider that serves as the impedance match. I have a very simple one LC circuit, one parallel LC circuit using a 7 to 100 picofarad trimmer and a coil that I think I measured around 5 microhenries, something like that. But it peaks up really well on 7 megahertz. It goes through a little 0.1 microfarad cap into a, a, another FET. Uh, and this is an FET RF amplifier. The, uh, the really the purpose of this is, is to present high impedance to this um, to this uh, LC circuit, so you're not loading it down. And it goes through here, and then from here, amplified a little bit of RF amplification. It goes to the input of the mix of the mixer, and so this signal mixes with the signal from the VFO. And ba -bam, boom, we get the audio output. The audio output then goes back through here and out into the speaker. So now, at this point in our program, I will demonstrate, I hope, how this thing works. It's, uh, it's, it's about 9 o'clock in the morning on uh, September 29th, 2022. Let me just crank this baby up and see what happens. This is 40 meters single sideband. Yikes. <laughs> Get down here, getting close to the CW portion. Not hearing any CW signals. Not hearing any FT8, which is kind of unusual. You have a great day too, old man. You know, I was listening to uh, German stations coming in on 40 meters, German amateur stations coming in on 40 meters last night, which was kind of fun. And this morning, before the band really opens, I can always hear Radio New Zealand kind of on the high end of the 40 meter band. I was also listening to um, uh, some 40 meter AM uh, on the high end of around 7295. But of course, with a direct conversion receiver, AM doesn't sound really, really good. Yeah, uh, I, uh, my wife has always said she can always put more clothes on. You can only take so many off. And Florida had absolutely zero appeal to her. She does not like me. And uh, um, in fact, if... Uh, you're in our house, you best better have a sweatshirt around because uh, it's rare that that... Prayers to all 
folks down uh, under Hurricane Ian. We're, we're, uh, we're hoping for the very best for you, and uh, uh, we'll be listening out for that. This is the RV service net. Let me just show you how the um, this circuit here tweaks it up and how, how it peaks up. I'll get a signal in here. Hold on. See that? Peaks it up. Yeah, Jupiter. I was watching Jupiter. I thought it was Venus. So I was at the Elton John concert, and I saw what I thought was Venus rising, but it was so bright, it was Jupiter. So we watched Jupiter rise over uh, National Stadium in D.C. Anyway, I digress. That's the, uh, the latest version of the direct conversion receiver. It's built on two boards. Um, that really come out of the uh, the packing material for the um, the pandemic treadmill that I've that I've used for so many rigs. That was a real a real windfall, homebrew windfall. There, uh, I guess repurposing windfall, and I have them just glued together. Um, this DC receiver, or some version of it in the future, may work its way into a school project that Dean and I are uh, engaged in. Farhan is doing the same thing over in India. And the idea is to, to come up with a circuit that's easily reproducible, that provides a good teaching moment for uh, high school kids. Uh, Farhan did something like this with his DC-40 receiver, I think with his niece, when he built a, um, a DC receiver for a school project for her double E program, I think it was. And we were thinking that um, a DC receiver is about the right level of complexity for newcomers that allows them to produce something that they can they can use even if they don't use the Morse code. I mean, the Michigan Mighty Might's nice, but I mean, there's only so much you could do with it. Whereas a DC receiver lets you listen to guys who are actually talking to each other, listen to um, digital signals down on the low end of uh, 40 meters, and and even get a sample or taste of CW if you want to hear what it sounds like. So that's how this uh, thing might evolve but I've been I've been pleased we've learned a lot about about mixers and and how they're configured and where you put the inputs and what you choose to balance out I can kind of understand why the West and others went very quickly to double balance mixers to diode ring mixers or to cross diode mixers whatever you want to call them but four diodes in there and kind of a ring configuration that multiplies by one and negative one it's almost a little bit easier to understand and to follow mentally than the, the simpler uh, two diode version. But anyway, that's the uh, that's what we've been working on here, and I just wanted to make a little little video. I hope you guys like it. Please subscribe to the to the YouTube channel, and uh, comments, of course, are welcome. Please let me know what you think about all this. Seven three from uh, Northern Virginia.